Hello and welcome everyone. We are so excited to be here and to start the zero to three track with you, especially because the two of us, we're going to be talking about two of our favorite uh, topics today, and that is early intervention and, of course, occupational therapy. So in today's chat, we're going to share a little bit about what early intervention is, what occupational therapy's unique role is in early intervention, and then also why early intervention is so important. I wanted to just take a minute to say, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and then when we get to the end of the presentation, we can try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Or if you want to, at that point, when we open up for questions, you can raise your hand and we can call on you and try to make it as collaborative as we possibly can. Looks like we're just a little bit frozen. I'll take this opportunity to say, I am Hattie. I am Sarah's co-presenter. Um, and we will be, let's see, it should be coming right back through. Sarah, let me know if you need me to share. Well, okay, so I can definitely, while she's going through that, describe and introduce myself. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Let's see, we're just back a, a couple of screens. So my name is Hattie. I am just a recently graduated occupational therapist. So I have just a little bit of experience. Um, I haven't started working professionally yet, but I did just graduate with my doctorate degree. So as a result, my professional experience is limited, but my doctorate degree was in researching early intervention. So that's where my heart and my soul are at. Um, I'm really passionate about occupational therapy and early intervention. Um, as I mentioned, I did have some research and that gave me a lot of experience in early intervention. I worked on developing early intervention programming in Belize, where there's no access to occupational therapy services at all. Um, through my experience, I learned a lot about the value of early intervention and the importance of cultural responsiveness. And I really came to be super passionate about giving the tools that we can to you as parents to empower caregivers. Outside of my experience in Belize, I have a long history of working with children in early childhood, as well as traveling. I love to volunteer as I travel. I've been to 25 countries. And I also like to scuba dive and camp. And as you can see here, I have a dog. Her name is Honey Bear. And she's my, you know, my favorite person. We spend a lot of time together. Okay, pass it back over to Sarah. Thank you, Hattie. <laughs> Not sure what happened on my end, but thank you for jumping in there. Um, all right, let's go back here and then we'll finally get back on track. So before we get into our discussion, I'll just give a brief overview of who I am. My name is Sarah. I've been an occupational therapist since 2009. I specialize working in early intervention and I also run my own private practice in that setting. I have two wonderful employees that work with me. And last year, I actually added the role of mom to, to my repertoire here. I have a 13-month-old daughter, and I actually have another little nugget on the way that's due this July. And I have to say that becoming a mom has completely shifted my perspective as a practitioner, especially being that I work with the same age range that my daughter is right now. And it really has given me a different lens about how I provide my services, how I go about my work. And I also just wanted to point out one of the pictures that you can see is actually of me and my dad. And this was maybe a week after my daughter was born. And a few other things about me, I'm a world traveler. And I also do a lot of international OT volunteer work while I'm traveling. I am also a scuba diver, <laughs> like Patty mentioned. I am a craft beer enthusiast. I'm a podcast host. I have my own show called OT for Life, and I also co-host two other occupational therapy podcasts. One is called The Real OTs of Early Intervention, and one is the other one is called The OT Roundtable. So clearly, I love talking about occupational therapy. I love traveling and volunteering and also talking about early intervention. So let's get back on to what our schedule here. <laughs> so before we jump into our discussion, we want to know what do you guys already know about early intervention? Is anyone unfamiliar with it? 
has anyone had a child that received early intervention services before? This would be a really great opportunity for you guys to briefly share your experiences and we can get more into this in the breakout rooms, but please raise the hand icon and I will call on you or you can um, put your thoughts in the comments chat box. And if you don't wanna share, that's perfectly fine too. We just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to share if they have um, a little bit of experience with early intervention. All right, no comments it looks like. So, so much to learn and we'll be able to share a lot with you guys. And feel free again, as Sarah said, to always put any of the questions that you have in the comment box and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. So to begin, what is early intervention? Well, it sounds pretty much self-explanatory. The idea is that we want to access these uh, delays as early as possible but really what they're intended to do is to support and strengthen the family system so that the family can then support their child's development as well as increasing their participation and independence. Who is it for? Well, early intervention services are intended for young children that are either experiencing some sort of developmental delay that either have an existing disability such as cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, or autism spectrum disorder, as I've heard mentioned here today, but also children who may be at risk for a delay. This could be children who were born prematurely, were exposed to drugs and alcohol in utero, or have been exposed to trauma. So maybe they don't yet have a delay, but there is a risk that they would develop a delay. They are also qualified. So it's important to note that all people are influenced by not only our own capacities, but also the people that are around us which is why it's so important that early intervention address families directly. It's not just services for the child, but for the entire family system, which I think is one of my favorite parts of early intervention. It's really cool that it's not just, I'm working with your child, I'm working with you and your fellow caregivers in order to give you guys tools and support. What services are offered? These typically include occupational therapy, physical therapy and speech therapy as needed but may also include developmental specialists, vision and hearing, social work, and more. The great thing about early intervention is that access is guaranteed for all child who qualify, or all children who qualify. This is a result of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. What this did is it provided federal protection for all eligible children at risk for developmental delay, as well as those qualifying disabilities. It usually includes children ages zero to three, but in some areas that can go all the way from zero to five. Services are delivered by the state and vary by region. So make sure to reach out um, in your local area to find out more about your local program. Now to get into what early intervention looks like in order to make sure that best practices were being enacted, an interdisciplinary team, which means it wasn't just occupational therapists, it also included physical therapists and speech therapists, as well as um, psychologists in early childhood, they came up with what they determined to be the principles of early intervention. What should all early intervention providers be practicing? And these are some of those principles. The first is that, as I mentioned in the last slide, early intervention is family-centered. This means that families are in control of the process and should be actively involved in all parts of the therapeutic process. This also means that the treatment plan is individualized to the needs and the priorities of each family. For this reason, the treatment plan is decided on by the family in collaboration with the providers rather than the providers just writing a plan and giving it to you or just telling you as parents what it should look like you are creating that plan in collaboration with the providers. And it's even called an individualized family service plan to emphasize how individualized it is and how central the family is to the whole process. The next principle is that these services should be delivered within your child's natural environment. Children, especially young children, learn best in familiar contexts. The ability to carry over newly learned skills to a different environment comes later in life which is why early intervention services occur in the family's home or community settings, such as the child's preschool or even maybe your local playground. Another principle is that the services should be strength-based. This means that rather than focusing in on your child's impairments, what they can't do or what they're not doing well, we focus on what they're great at. 
What do they love? Does your child love music instruments? Great. How can we use that or any other strength as a bridge to overcome the barriers that your child is facing that are getting in the way of their participation? And we also don't, we also make a point not to just look at the child's strengths. Again, because it's family centered, we want to look at the strengths of the entire family and the environment that your family works in. This brings me to a really important point that I learned while I was in Belize. Although some families may have limited physical or financial resources, all families are resourceful. Attentiveness, patience, engagement, those are strengths that cannot be bought and that are invaluable to your child's development. This is what we mean by strengths-based services. In early intervention, we're looking for those sort of strengths so that we can help you utilize them in order to support your child's development. Another one of my favorite things about early intervention is that we're routine based. This means that our recommendations and our strategies are incorporated into your daily routines. So for example, if your child has cerebral palsy and that has limited the range of motion of their arm, we might recommend every time you're doing a diaper change, let's do some big circles with their arms or we'll do the stretches that are recommended. So rather than you having to think about, oh, when am in my day, am I gonna get around to those stretches? It's incorporated into that daily routine, which gives a good way for you to tie it in easily without adding more to your load. The idea is that we recognize and respect that parents, especially parents of children with special needs are very busy. And also young children rely on routine. This allows the child to receive therapeutic intervention without an upset in their routine, while also reducing the load that's expected on parents. Next, the um, services are often include a large team, as I mentioned before, including physical therapists, speech therapists, and more. So it is expected that we work together as a team across disciplines so that it makes it as easy as possible and seamless as possible for you as the parent. Finally, it's evidence-based. This means that all the strategies and recommendations we provide should be backed up by evidence and that there should be research to support what we're suggesting. All right, so now that we've laid out what early intervention is, I want to chat a little bit about what occupational therapy's role and what an OT practitioner's role is on the early intervention team. So to start, I want to define occupational therapy. Occupational therapy is a profession that seeks to promote mental and physical wellness in people across the lifespan through the use of therapeutic use of uh, everyday activities. In today's world, occupations can be widely known as maybe professions or jobs, but in fact, occupations are way more than that. Occupations are defined as meaningful and purposeful daily activities that people participate in, AKA what occupies your time during your day. But sometimes things in life happen, and this could be an accident, an injury, or a developmental delay that can interfere with these meaningful activities. So occupational therapy practitioners are experts on occupations and they study the how and why people engage in these daily activities. They then utilize these meaningful activities or occupations to, prove their, to improve their client's health and get them participating in the things that are really important to them. So occupational therapy practitioners, we strive to build skills, to make adaptations, to to increase independence, and to improve function for our clients. So then as an OT practitioner in early intervention, we address the daily occupations of children. And this can include eating, dressing, self-care, sleeping, you name it, lots of different things that young children do throughout their day. And all of this, everything that we address as an occupational therapy practitioner is all done through the modality of play. Of course, this is a child's favorite thing and probably one of their most valuable occupations. We as occupational ther therapy practitioners work within the family, family's routines to address delays in skills such as fine and gross motor, cognition, social emotional, and also adaptive behavior skills. We utilize a holistic lens to look at the environment, the family dynamics, the support systems, as well as the child's unique skills in order to provide supports and strategies that best help the kids, as well as the family dynamic as a whole. 
So now that you know what early intervention is and a little bit more about occupational therapy, I want to discuss, I just want to briefly discuss the importance of early intervention. So to start, I just wanted to draw your attention to the very first point on the slide and let's talk about some stats here. So research suggests that 80% of a child's brain is formed between pregnancy and age three. And in addition, they also say that a young child's brain is twice as active as an adult's brain and that they are the most adaptable at this point, really making it possible for so much change to happen and happen easier and faster than kind of later on in life. So needless to say, a lot of change happens kind of during this pivotal age period of zero to three. The next big part that we wanna bring up and Hattie kind of talked about this previously is the importance of the family and the caregivers, which can honestly be the biggest part the biggest part, like I'm going to highlight that, the biggest part of the early intervention team. As practitioners, we can see clients maybe once a month, maybe once a week, and if we're lucky, twice a week, which in my area rarely happens. But the parents and the caregivers, the family, the, the support system that is always with the child, they're with them 24-7. So ultimately, the, the change and the progress is due to the work that the families do, the caregivers, the parents, anybody that's involved in the child's care with just a little bit of kind of guidance and support from us as practitioners. And then outside of the benefit for the child and the families, early intervention services have been found to achieve, to achieve more and cost less than services delivered later. So not only are we seeing that early intervention services and the early intervention program is good for the child, the individual child, the individual family unit, but we're also kind of seeing this, this kind of global good, the, the societal good that it does ac across the board. As occupational therapy practitioners in early intervention, we have learned to celebrate each and every small win that a child and or a family experiences. When a child first learns to lift their head in tummy time, or that first time that their eyes kind of catch and focus on a toy, we know that this has so much implications kind of for future development. And with that being said, our goal as early intervention practitioners is for our kids to graduate from services. We're here as OT practitioners to really kind of support the child's development for as little or as long as it really is necessary. So I'm looking at the time here. We know that there is no way that we could possibly say everything there is about early intervention in just this kind of short discussion, but hopefully you have a little bit better understanding about what early intervention is, and then also what occupational therapy's, occupational therapy's role is as a part of the early, excuse me, 